I spent some time trying to read contemporary literature about conscience. I thought you might learn something from the medical association about what they think about conscience, but I found it was so mixed up with philosophy and psychology that it just wasn't worth the time. People were trying to figure out how conscience evolved, how many years it would have taken for some creature lower than people to, uh, to develop conscience. And there was no continuity, no, you know, sort of the same idea dressed in different clothes by people. It was totally off the wall things, what people were saying. So I was really glad that uh, we could settle that and just leave it out and get down to discuss what the Bible has to say about conscience. I assume that almost all of us tonight know what we mean by conscience because it's something that we learn from our own experience if we haven't learned it from the scriptures. So I thought, well, you couldn't really start in a better place. This is one of the subjects that really, if you want to introduce it, as uh, Brother Jesse said, you have to start in Genesis. And Genesis 2 does a very good, or Genesis 3 rather, does a very good job of, of developing it. So we know that the woman and the man had been told by God not to partake of this tree of the knowledge of good and food, but as the passage leads up to verse six, it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her and he ate. If that's a little bit different, it's because I'm always quoting from the New King James tonight. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now it's interesting how the angel of God challenges Adam, who told you you were naked? I wonder if Adam thought about that for a bit. There was no voice of the serpent. There was no other voice in the garden that was telling him he was naked. It was his conscience telling him he was naked. Now that is a most interesting idea to work through the scriptures. Not what we're gonna do tonight, but it's a very interesting idea of how that idea of being naked is used in the Bible and how it's related to conscience. So they got together, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings and then hearing the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves. It would be like the angel saying, why did you hide yourself? Because he was ashamed. Now, there was no years of development for Adam and Eve to get to this point of having a conscience. There's nothing suggested that God had to give them a 101 on conscience before they actually would have known how to do this. It was spontaneous. When they sinned, when they disobeyed God, they became ashamed of their nakedness and they hid themselves. And those things are used together many times in the word of God for us to think over when we talk about conscience. See, Eve's conscience was initially because you would sort of think, well, if she had a conscience, why didn't she use it before she ate of the tree? Well, the Bible tells us why, and it's found in the New Testament where it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses two and three, Paul says, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, without going into what the Apostle Paul was telling the Corinthians, the basis on which he he stated it was because the serpent had deceived Eve with his craftiness. Now, that tells you a little about the company you keep, doesn't it? Because... There's no suggestion that she would have done this. It hadn't been, she was in the company of a crafty creature. 
who was telling her things that she didn't know how to deal with. It tells us that it really is important to know where you're going and where you're going to end up. If she hadn't been so close to the tree, which was in the middle of the garden, she may never have touched it, even though she acknowledged that he had said, don't touch it. Because you get closer and closer to something until you can't stop. And that's apparently what happened to her. So there's a lot of things related to conscience which are really valuable to us. And I couldn't possibly deal with them all in one evening, as you would probably know if you've studied the theme yourself. So what we intend to do is just take a sampling to give us an idea of the power of conscience. Like it's a very powerful thing. If you have a conscience, well, let's say it another way. If you know somebody who has a conscience, it will be obvious to them. Like they're always talking about, well, I... Have you thought of this, or have you thought of that, or I don't really want to go there? You know that there's something going on in their mind that they're aware of, it seems, constantly, because their conscience is guiding them. So it's important for us to try to develop some ideas along that end. Well, if anyone came here tonight just to find out where your conscience is, (laughs) because they thought that's really all we wanted to tell you, well, let me just say this. These are my ideas. I didn't quote them somewhere, so they may be imperfect. Our ability to engage in moral judgment is found somewhere in our brain. We wouldn't look to our foot. It wouldn't be that if a person had to have their foot amputated, they would lose their conscience. And you can think about that a bit to know that yeah, people have concluded it's somewhere, but it's, it's not such that it's an organ or it's something uh, completely re move from other things, it's somewhere in the brain. There we evaluate our view of life, there we judge ourselves according to our moral understanding. Now that opens up another area of consideration I don't want to go down tonight either because I have often thought at times when the dog that we used to have when we were on the farm looked at me a certain way, I knew he'd done something wrong. You've probably had the same experience if you have a pet. And you wonder, does does the dog have a conscience? Well, they certainly wouldn't have a conscience according to the moral code that we as humans keep. But it wouldn't be wrong to think that you could teach animals the idea of conscience. In other words, you, you treat them so that they know, don't do that. And somehow or other, they give you a look to say, I just did it. And hence, uh, you do what you do when the dog does that. Number three, Adam and Eve did not need lessons on how to engage their consciences. So we really don't need to go to a a university and spend three or four years there to find out how conscience works and come back to the ecclesia to tell everybody about it because God made us this way. God knew that we would need something like what we're describing, conscience. An act of disobedience brought it suddenly into action. Like they didn't know they were naked before. They didn't have that shame. They weren't afraid to go out and talk to the angels. But when conscience kicked in, somehow or other, all of a sudden, those things happened. And that's the way conscience works with us. Sometimes it happens very suddenly. And you wonder, why am I doing this? Why did I say that? And it's because conscience has been working and uh, sort of just monitoring what we've been doing, what we've been saying, and it's, it's keeping a record. Like sometimes you can sort of feel the, uh, that or listen to that voice that's saying you're getting a bit close. And uh, we'll talk a little about that a little later on. Now, isn't it just interesting how some of these things come up? This idea, he is of age, ask him. You know where that comes from in the Bible. It speaks about the age of majority. A lot of young people want to get to the age when they have now the freedom to go out and vote and take part in society and be counted and uh, to be able to, you know, go into a bar and and, uh, ask for liquor and, and be part of the boys or the girls, as the case may be. 
So in this case, there was some other reason why the parents said to the authorities, uh, this is our son, and we know he was born blind, by what means he now seeth, we know not, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. He is of age, ask him, and he shall speak for himself. But one of the things we want to remember, young people, if we're thinking about this, is how God drew a line on this in the wilderness. If you are 20 years old or older, you will die in the wilderness. Why did he draw it at 20? Now, I don't mean by saying that, that we want to know why it was 20 and not 21. I mean, why did he draw the line at all? Because he realized that what he had made would take time for children to come to appreciate the moral standards of which God would hold them accountable. And so we see this act of judgment, and in this particular case, the parents were taking advantage of it. He is of age, you ask him. And it would seem to be it was because of a fear. If they had said something that, that uh, offended them, they themselves might have been thrust out of the synagogue. So there was a penalty, it seemed, that his parents were trying to avoid. But here's one that's really telling, and most of us know this. We've read these things many times. That's the advantage of doing our readings where we read the whole Bible every year. So in John 8, verses 7 to 9, it says, So when they continued asking him, that's asking Jesus, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. He brought this woman, taken in the act of adultery, no question about that. Uh, should we stone her or should we not stone her? And so that's the answer the Lord gave. And then he just stooped down and wrote on the ground. And then those who heard his comment, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. That is the, the pure record of scripture to tell us about these things. And when you can see it beginning at the oldest and to the last, you, you might uh, think about that a bit. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was uh, an older person was able to be uh, counted more um, responsible because they were older, it could just have meant that he had committed it more often than younger ones. So that by what Jesus had said in his own testimony, it's not just the man who does this, it's the man who thinks about it, who meditates on it in his mind. So whatever he wrote on the ground, he doesn't tell us, but these people hearing his remarks convicted by their conscience. You can imagine that they were just hit by it. Like what he's saying means I should be stoned. Sorry, I'm leaving. Gone. Until at last there was only the woman and Jesus there alone. That's conscience. And that's the way it happens sometimes when we haven't been thinking about what we're doing and we're becoming a hypocrite. We're condemning others. We're even prepared to take them to a place where they could be stoned and killed. Not thinking that we've committed the same crime. Why is it that conscience has to be awakened this way? But certainly, if we're doing our readings, that might be the way of our salvation. That we finally realize that what we have been saying about others and what we know is wrong, we've been doing ourselves. We just haven't been thinking about it enough. but you can disable your conscience. I wouldn't have used that word beforehand, but a lot of things can be disabled on the computer today, and you know that's the language we have to continually work in, how it's changing. But it's, it's seared in the scriptures. Seared, it means it's made insensitive by pressing flesh with a red hot iron. It's, a, it's a kind of a vicious thing to even think about. But when your conscience is seared, you might just think, it's ruined. I tried to do a little investigation into how a wound that you may have in your hand 
and when it scars up as to whether it ever really recovers fully. And although it was acknowledged that in some cases nerves do grow back in that scar tissue, it's never the same. And I would think that's the same way it is with a seared piece of flesh, that although it, it does get healed, it's never quite the same. So in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, it says, The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Well, it sounds just a little bit like Eve. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now I found many, many, for many, many years when we were reading this section of scripture with my parents at home, I, I couldn't think of how that could happen. Like would anybody forbid to marry? It wasn't until I got into this situation of reading this book, Unholy Orders. It's a Canadian book. It's written about what happened in one of these schools, residential schools, and actually it was an orphanage run by the Roman Catholic Church in St. John's, Newfoundland. And it was only back in, say, the 70s when this occurred and how it was covered up for a number of years before it was finally exposed. And, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this is what's supposed to happen in Canada shortly that Pope Francis will meet indigenous leaders and residential school supervisors, or survivors rather, doing his, during his July 24 to 29 visit. The Vatican says, and apparently that visit's still on. Why does the Pope have to come? He comes to apologize. Well, why would he come? Who is he apologizing on behalf of? Well, he's not doing that on behalf of Christadelphians. He's doing that on behalf of Catholics. And of course, that's what people remember. And one of the interesting things was he doesn't come because he wants to come. It's because there were so many people who were making such a disturbance about this, about the hundreds of bodies that were found around these, or in, the, in the ground, around these residential schools, which were children that somehow died. There's uh, not a whole lot of records about how they died, but there they were that the Pope realized what was happening in these Catholic-run uh, residential schools. I just think it's, it's most, most valuable for, for us to keep our mind on the news a little. Well, there's a lot of false th stories out there. So many of these things are really connected to the Bible, and that's one of them, right out of that verse we just read. The power of conscience to condemn. Uh, when conscience cannot be ignored. Do you think that your conscience could override your behavior? That conscience could commit you to do something that you would never do otherwise? Not a good thing, but an evil thing? Well, think of it. Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. It's interesting how in the Matthew record, I didn't want to take the time on conscience to deal with this, but if you go back to chapter 26, and just see the little exchange between Jesus and Judas in the Last Supper of how Judas says um, something like, am I the person? When Jesus was saying someone was going to betray me and Jesus said, thou hast said. And Jesus had just said prior to that, it would have been better for that man who is my betrayer if he had never been born. So it could very well be that the words of Jesus are words that are very, very stirring to people. Do you ever find that in reading the Gospels, that the Gospels are, are words, of, the words of Jesus in particular, are words that really grip you? 
They can make you feel stronger in certain aspects of, of conscience related things than you would feel otherwise. And you sort of wonder what it will ever be like to face Jesus at the judgment seat when he asks us about some of the behavior that we've had, maybe things we've forgotten and never even sought forgiveness for. Those things uh, were never ignored and I, I just think conscience needs to have that programmed into it. Remember Jesus as our judge. Isn't it interesting how the power of conscience doesn't fade in years? People obsess with guilt for something they did years later. Genesis 42, verse 21. Then they said one to another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Doesn't the record tell us here that these brethren must have suffered I don't know whether you could say suffered immensely, but if you can remember something that really bothers you and you just can't seem to get rid of it, and it, it just plagues you, like you, you, you just every now and then, it all comes back into your mind again, and you just wish you could get rid of it. God provided forgiveness for that. That's why we're baptized, to have our sins forgiven, taken away out of our mind, so we don't have those feelings. Or if we do, they come back into our mind, we, quickly get rid of them because that's what forgiveness does. It's not that we can't remember the event. We don't suffer the guilt of it. But when those brothers heard the voices or the voice of Joseph in that hole that was dug and he couldn't get out of it, that haunted them for years afterwards. Even after they had initially taken it to Joseph and he had answered them in such a delightful way, they still really didn't believe him. They were haunted by it still. And they'd taken it up with Jacob and they still couldn't get over it until the very end. After Jacob dies, they have to come and sort of bow down to Joseph and say, well, we sort of figured you were just waiting for the death of your father. Now you will really get us. They, they had a hard time with getting rid of the guilt of that event. We don't want to underestimate what bad things can do to our mind to our conscience. Now there's a good conscience. You see, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, the purpose of the commandment is love, or agape, from a pure heart, a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Well, that's a modification of conscience. What is a good conscience separated from just a conscience? from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor things which they affirm. That's what got them into trouble. They didn't understand what they said or what they affirmed. They lacked real good understanding. A conscience can't really make good decisions or help us in those decisions if it's made on, on bad information. So we've got to make sure that what we get in our conscience is, is from the Bible. And not from the courses on psychology and the courses on many other things related to conscience that people have thought of apart from the Bible. Now the power of conscience to judge whether a teaching is correct is something that Christadelphians probably need to know maybe do know better than a lot of other people because we concentrate on that. Our teachings and our beliefs are quite unique in a lot of areas and we can't afford to just let it melt away. We can't afford to just melt into Christendom and just be like everybody else. And sometimes you need to see that happening to know that that's what we want to avoid. When we see People now backing away from the fact that Jesus is the only name under heaven whereby we can be saved and reaching out to other world religions and saying, well, we all worship one God. They don't say which God, they just say we're all worshiping one God and we all join together on that basis. Not what our Bible teaches. 
2 Timothy 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That's going back to Eve again, being ashamed by our consciences, but rightly dividing the word of God. And then this very wonderful verse, I myself make a lot of this because it becomes very, very important to me to be able to handle the differences between right and wrong. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That is the most satisfying way to deal with issues that we find that come out of the Bible or are in our life. It's just compare what the Bible has to say in various places. And the Bible won't contradict itself. And if it seems to, just keep digging because the word of God does not contradict itself. God will never contradict himself. Our safety is that when we come back to find out whether our teaching is correct is to make sure it's filled in with many things that the word of God says, comparing spiritual with spiritual. A power of conscience over religious defilement. Now, here's where you start to see people who made something of their consciences. And I, I just think that there's many, many examples of this. So these are just a few. But this is a good one because, you see, here's Daniel going off to the University of Babylon. Okay, so our young people quite often will go off to tertiary education. They go to a college or go to a university. And to do that, they have to rub shoulders with people who are more advanced in thinking. They have to rub shoulders with professors who in some cases think they know better than anybody else. And Daniel ends up at the University of Babylon and right away he's being offered what he says is, is offered to idols. That would be the, the reason for this thing that he says. And he purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So he's taking the initiative. Now, that's conscience that does that. It's conscience that propels us beyond just saying, you know, I, I really don't want to get into this. I, I, I just don't feel comfortable with doing that. But our consciences will, will make us get out there and do it. That's what a good conscience is like. Conscience can't just be a faint voice in the back of our heads every now and then telling us something. It's got to be something that's forcefully coming upon us so that, hey, we've got to do something about this and then get out and do it. So even in the matter of eating and drinking, Daniel purposed in his heart he wouldn't defile himself. So it comes into many everyday experiences. To set an example, well, Look at what Nehemiah did. It's recorded in chapter five, verse 15. He talks about the former governors. He was the governor at the time. But the former government, uh, governors who were before me and laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. You see, many, many people are corrupted by that process. It's money. It's wealth. It's security. It's all the things you can do with money. So if I'm governor, why wouldn't I do what other governors had done? Why wouldn't I just follow what the other people have, have led governors into doing? Well, because in this case, these people are too poor. They cannot afford it. And so Nehemiah did not do it. That's conscience working. I'll deny myself something to stand up for the principle. I will not demand of these people what they can't afford to do. That's honorable. I think Job is one of the best examples of conscience. You, you can't come to the book of Job thinking that this man has an evil that's bothering him called self-righteousness. For the self-righteousness that he might have, we have to make sure that we understand it in the light of what God said about him, that this man was perfect. Now, he'd, it would be complete as he could be complete 
maybe in, the, in those particular days. So he's not a match for the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was setting himself up by the fact that his conscience was working above many, many others. Look at what he said in, in Job 31. Now this is before Jesus makes his point in Matthew chapter 5 about looking on a woman. He says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? What is the allotment of, from God above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? It's like, how did Job come to this point of view in his understanding? Why, did it, why was it a way of conscience? Because he understood the way of life and the way of death. The people who, who didn't do what God said and, and just you know, boycotted, I will not do what God says, were in the way of destruction and disaster for the workers of iniquity. Well, how much more of a problem have we got today when a person with their cell phone can view pornography in their own space in the darkness of night without anybody else, humans that is, knowing. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that our young people have such a handle on this that they learn to control their eyes, that they see something they shouldn't be looking at. There's a voice of conscience clicks in. Suddenly, you shouldn't be doing this, and they can turn away from it because that is the way to live in God's sight and not to suffer the destruction and disaster of the workers of iniquity. The way he dealt with others fairly, he says in verse 13 of Job 31, if I have despised the cause of my male or female servant when they complained against me, what then should I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? Did not he make who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? You can see how that, that Job had an understanding and the understanding was what was driving him in this. So he wanted to make sure when he dealt with his servants, he dealt with them fairly. Like, I'm just a servant. I, I, I'm not a servant of these people. They're a servant of mine, but I'm serving somebody. I understand a servant is essentially what he's saying. And I got a report to my God. And when he rises up and he calls me in question, what will I say? That idea of fairness in our dealing with others is a very important value to cherish, to establish it in our children. You know, and it's interesting because I think that children seem to be uh, made with this. Like you see a lot of children will say, well, he's got more than I have. Isn't that come from fairness? Like it does come from the idea that I want, I want to be, you know, this to be equaled up. So he doesn't get more than I have. But it comes with a sense of fairness. If you marked, you know, a question one way on this person's paper, then, you know, when this person comes and he gets it wrong and that person got it right and it's exactly the same answer, the students come to the teacher and say, well, that's not fair. And that, that fairness comes with children never being taught that. They just have that in them. But do they always have it? Do they see it this way? That's when a good conscience comes into play. And then I found that even happens in farming. Now, I, I had a hard time with this one, but I, I learned that just believe what the Word of God says. Because Job said in chapter 31, verse 38, if my land cries out against me and its furrows weep together, if I have eaten its fruit without money or caused its owners to lose their lives, then let thistles grow instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. The words that Job are ended. Now I wonder if that ever crosses our mind when we're out in the field and we're thinking, I just keep taking from that ground. I keep sowing and taking, sow and take, sow and... I never put anything back into the ground. I never break the ground up. I never add anything to it that the ground needs to continue to have the nutrients for that crop. That's the kind of idea that I think that Job was referring to. Like, my furrows weep together. Oh, we've got to produce another crop. 
and we don't have the resources to do it. <laughs> she would think, well, why would a man even think that about land? Why wouldn't you just leave it to how you deal with people? But that's where conscience goes. Like conscience reaches out to everything. Like you're not being fair. I think that's quite remarkable. So, brethren who have it, <laughs> you know, it's something to think about. Now, obviously, the greatest example of conscience is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it says so. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and Peter certainly knew his Lord. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now to suffer and not think that you're hard done by, whether it's, it's because you have a disease, whether it's because you've had an accident, whether it's because uh, you're being taken advantage of by somebody who is, who is uh, not paying you what is owed to you. Jesus, he didn't do any of those things, those natural things that we would you know, go to the extent of finding how we could even it up. He just committed himself to him that judges righteously. Now that is really a belief in God and it's, it's not hard to reason from what God has said that that's the way we should be. If our God never fails us, never forsakes us, then that's part of what it means, committed himself to him that judges righteously. God knows everything. He knows exactly what's happened. He knows what we're gonna do about it before we do it. So to commit ourselves to God would take faith, but it's the right direction for conscience. Now, life in 2022 is no garden of Eden. There was a serpent there, but it says in 2 Timothy chapter three, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And then after listing a number of things of the character of these people, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power from such people, turn away. Well, when you see a picture like that, it, it, uh, it gives you a little flavor for what this means. It would be one thing to see those those flags, we've seen a lot of them. You may have a neighbor like we had, who had a flag, this rainbow flag out in their front lawn right across from us. And it, it, did, ignore, it did annoy me very often when I went by it. But to see our prime minister of Canada out there rejoicing with these people, when this man is a, is a religious man, is gonna meet with the Pope and direct the Pope around who is religious, you can see what it means that perilous times are coming. People loving pleasure rather than loving God. That's the environment in which we live today and which our children are being brought up in. So the work of conscience is gonna be something that we really need to take hold of. So we gotta to get to work on this. So in James chapter four, we have boundaries. We have things which we really need to know. It says in verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not do it, to him it is sin. Now that's something that we want to write on a little sign somewhere, especially if we have to deal with procrastination. And if anybody doesn't have to deal with that, please talk to me. I'd love to know how you manage to do it. We just tend to procrastinate, leave something that we don't really maybe like, but we have to do, or do something we've been thinking about, but no, there's gonna be a lot of preparation in period, so we just sort of ignore it. Those kinds of things are, are not gonna get us by this verse 17. If you know to do good, do it. If you don't do it, it's being disobedient. What are the grounds? You knew you should do it. It's knowledge. It's responsibility through knowledge. 
And God will surely do it because he's showed us many, many examples. Now, I, I like in a, being in a hammock by a lake too, but the picture just captures the idea of a person who is, is not really up and at it. Then there comes to the time when we've got to object to things which are a little more difficult to do and could get us into some difficulty. But look at how it happened in Acts chapter 5. The authorities came to the apostles and they said, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. I think their consciences were already blocked up. Didn't they say to Pilate, his blood be on us and on our children? How could it be any different now to, to not remember that? And then to demand that they are doing this, in this case, bring to this man's blood on us. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And you wonder how that happened. Did Peter say it and then the other apostles say it? Like it, it says Peter and the other apostles. It may have been they were interrogated individually. And that could be the reason why each of them ended up. We ought to obey God rather than men. Or it could have been, you know, just a, a group speaking all at once. We ought to obey God rather than men. Well, there may be times, as people have had to do when it came to going to war, that you have to stand up and say, we want to obey our God rather than than the government of Canada. Certainly people have done that before us. There's records of it and how they have, have uh, fared in it. And uh, a lot of things would be very valuable for us because you can see that people are certainly being called up in Russia and they're certainly being called up in Ukraine. Uh, it's, you know, it was really brought up to our attention when the fact that people wanted to get out of Ukraine, well, the women could go and the children could go, but the men, you stay. You've got to stay. You can't go with your wife and your children. You've got to defend Ukraine. I wonder how many of them ever would survive to go to be with their children and their wife again. Suffer yourselves to be prodded. You see, things get difficult when you want to stand up for your conscience. Brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. That's a particular case. So you have a, a brother in, a, in an ecclesia, he has a problem with another brother. He thinks that he's being hard done by and he can't settle it with that brother. So he takes him to court in the country in which he lives. That's what the problem was here. Now, therefore, the apostle says, there's utterly a failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? You see, you wouldn't even think that if it wasn't that you have a good conscience it's being based on what the Word of God's had to say. So your conscience says, if I have to be cheated, I'll be cheated. I am not going to law with this person. There's not many more, so just hold on if you're, you know, flagging a little bit in this. I think this making no provision for the flesh is really wise counsel. In Romans 13, verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And that's as simple as saying, don't feed the flesh. But this one caught my eye. Now, this was statistics taken from the United States, not from Canada. And it was the year 2020, not this year. The year 2020, the number one cause of death among youth was guns. Now, that would be pretty hard to imagine. Over all the children that die of disease, all the children that die in accidents, the majority of the young people were dying because of guns. How did they get the guns? Well, because people had made provision for the flesh. If someone comes into this house, I'm going to defend myself. The gun is in here. 
and tells the family about it. That's where the gun is. It's in a drawer somewhere in his cabinet. But sometimes you couldn't imagine what might happen because you've made provision for the flesh that someone would reach out in a fit of anger, grab the gun and shoot somebody else when in you know, other circumstances they'd never even think about it. But you made provision for the flesh. And that's the kind of thing we must think of when we, we try to imagine how we could avoid that is don't set yourself up for failure. Don't provide for the things that lead to such an, a, an end. So pricked in their heart, yes, that's exactly the words in Acts chapter 2. People had, uh, had been listening to the apostles and they had known that Jesus, whom they had crucified, was made both Lord and Christ. And when they heard that, they were pricked in the heart. Now, I don't think there was a, they were all having minor heart attacks. It would seem to me that's the work of conscience. That's what conscience does. They are just being condemned by what they've done. And they said, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, then that's where baptism comes in. And that's why baptism is so important. When people can't get rid of guilt, you come to God. And God is very merciful to bless us with forgiveness of our sins. That's the wonderful thing about Christianity and the way that Jesus made it. So we, we need to do a U-turn in that case. And baptism, it's very interesting to just look at this. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that baptism, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now what does it mean to be the answer of a good conscience? Well, we need to look up answer. An answer, and this is vine. I don't know if you've used vines at all, but I find that if you really need to have a little bit more about a word, use vine. At least that's one other place you can go. And he says that in First Peter 3, verse 21, is not, as in the King James, an answer. It was used by the Greeks in a legal sense as a demand or appeal. Baptism is therefore the ground of an appeal by a good conscience against wrongdoing. It's the way to deal with what has gone wrong and what needs to be put right. And when a one's conscience gets to make that very clear, then baptism is the way to deal with it. So you, you come to the same conclusion. It's just interesting how that word answer needs to be clarified. We do examine ourselves. That's the purpose of our memorial meeting. It's a work of conscience. Let a man examine himself. Then let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That is another very important sort of verse to put on a, a plaque somewhere and remember it. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Maybe, you know, you think of putting words on which I can well imagine that many people have thought we could do with some kind of words here or, or there, somewhere where we can think that, well, if we would judge ourselves, it's really what we're doing when we're partaking of the memorials. And if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. God's not going to judge us on something we've never heard of and say, well, you know, you never read this book and you ask, well, what book is that? We've never heard of it. He's going to judge us according to the book that he gave us. And so we should be able to judge ourselves so that we don't run into this problem of being judged because we didn't abide by it. So very quickly, convicted by conscience, a seared conscience, longevity of conscience, correct teaching, pricked in the heart, examine our performance, control your eyes, object to ungodly demands, overcome procrastination, make no provision for the flesh. If you can remember half of them, I hope you would feel it was worth listening to this tonight. But you're not getting off that easy. There's a test. 
Hey, this will take you about 30 seconds. No, no, maybe three seconds. You will have the answer. This is a test. Where is your conscience? Should we or shouldn't we not? Well, if we need to investigate, it says pack with vitamins, fiber, particularly high levels of antioxidants known as polyphenols. Strawberries are sodium-free, fat-free, cholesterol-free, low-calorie food. They are among the 20 top fruits in antioxidant capacity and are a good source of manganese and potassium. That's question one. Here's two. Ah, uh, it got you on this, but maybe not. If you do your investigation, heavy whipping cream contains important fat-soluble vitamins, including vitamin A, D, E, and K. Full fat dairy products such as heavy whipping cream contain more of these vitamins than low fat or non-fat dairy. Fat-soluble vitamins are better absorbed by your body when they are consumed with fat. I don't know about that, but it, it, it sounds pretty good. So I would say, enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>